Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special program as part of Barnard's Reunion Reimagined. My name is Ada Guerrero Gugliad, and I'm a graduate of the class of 1988 and a member of the Reunion Committee. We're also joined today by Julia Luby, Lube, sorry, class of 2018, and Ann Goldberg for helping make this event possible. As a quick reminder, this online event enables an att attendee to participate through a personal device, such as a microphone and or camera. An attendee may elect not to participate through use of a microphone or a camera. And the election of attendee to use a microphone or, and or a camera constitutes a release and waiver of rights in the capture of the attendee's image, likeness, and or voice for the exclusive use by Barnard College. We have two very special guests with us today, Christine Valencia Shin, class of 1984, and Lisa Lewis Miller, class of 2010. Our first presenter is Christine Valencia Shin. She's an associate dean for Beyond Barnard, the, co the college's hub for advising and resources around careers, internships, competitive fellowships, and applications to graduate and professional school. She oversees both day-to-day -day operations and supports ongoing strategic planning. Christine has been with Bar Beyond Barnard, previously career development or career services in my year, since 2009, advising and developing programs for students and alumni and from 2018 to 2020, leading the advising and programs team. Earlier in her career, she was a teacher, a teacher educator. At Barnard, Christine majored in history and minored in education. Welcome, Christine. Uh, thank you, Ava. And thank you to everyone on the reunion committee for everything you've done to Make this uh, make this possible. We're really excited to be one of the first uh, first events here at Reunion this year. Um, as Ava mentioned, I'm an alumna of the college, and I'm associate dean of Beyond Barnard, which she also uh, mentioned. Depending on when you were at Barnard, you might have known as Barnard Career Services or the Office of Career Development, which had the unfortunate email of OCD at barnard.edu for a while. Um, so just one of many reasons for changing the name, I suppose. Uh, Beyond Barnard was a rethinking of career services launched in February of 2018, uh, right before the inauguration of um, President Bylock. Uh, and it's been a highlight of my long and varied career to be a part of this rethinking and reorganization of traditional career services to include all paths beyond Barnard, uh, starting while you know students are still here and including um, internships, campus and community jobs, um, careers, career exploration, fellowship opportunities, graduate and professional school. It all, all comes under our purview, under our umbrella. And it's been uh, really exciting to build that out and, and, and market it out and, and have just amazing student and alumni participation. Beyond Barnard, although relatively new, uh, continues the college's long-standing commitment to free lifetime career support to all graduates, um, and advising and developing programs for alumni remains one of my favorite parts of my job. Uh, not least of which is we learn so much from you, um, both when you come back to campus or via Zoom to share your career insights, um, your mentoring with students, um, but the advising itself, um, just every time I sit down with, with an alum and hear about their journey, um, it reminds me, it, it teaches me about the world of work, it teaches me about specific fields, and um, apropos to today, the many and varied ways that career paths unfold and the pivots people make along the way. Uh, before I introduce our uh, facilitator for today, I just wanted to mention a couple of upcoming summer programs that you should be watching your email for. Um, I am starting in two weeks from today, uh, my traditional summer series on uh, Jumpstart Your job, job Search. 
page. Um, it's eight sessions on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be recorded uh, starting June 14th and lasting through early August. Um, and uh, registration info for that will be forthcoming very shortly. Um, and I'll give you a link to the, uh, to the web page, and then the registration link should be up very soon. Um, also in June, a date to be determined is the second event in a three-part series that I'm working on with Ann Goldberg also on in today's session, uh, co-sponsored by Beyond Barnard and Alma Maters. We're doing a three-part series on supporting parents in their many roles during the pandemic. And I'll be hosting the second session, which is uh, focusing on changing your status in the workplace, um, looking at some of the practical and strategic realities of if you've decided to leave work for a time or scale back to part-time, or perhaps you did leave and you want to come back, or you're just thinking about what you want to be doing uh, in the interim while you're, you know, it, it, especially if, if COVID and, and some of the way things have unfolded have had an impact on, on your current status. Um, as we go along, I'll post some links in the chat with information about uh, some Beyond Barnard programs and, and these programs as well. But before, uh, before those uh, more strategic sessions come up, let's get started on today's session, session which focuses on a uh, probably more important and an even more fundamental question is what do you want to be doing and how do you figure that out? We were so excited when Lisa Lewis Miller, class of uh, 2010, reached out to us last fall about sharing her career clarity insights with fellow alumni. Uh, and after uh, finally was able to connect with Lisa, have a conversation and hearing more about her work and how she came to it, reunion seemed the perfect fit. So here we are today, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce her to you as the facil facilitator of today's workshop. And I'm gonna tell you a little about her of her official bio. If there's a job out there, Lisa Lewis Miller has probably done it. Lisa is a career change expert, author, and founder of Career Clarity, a company helping individuals step into soulful, lucrative, and joyful careers. Her path evolved into coaching after working in digital marketing, marketing for nearly a decade at companies like 2U, Edelman, the American Cancer Society, Teen Vogue, 17, Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, and CBS College Sports. Lisa has been featured in the Washington Post, Business Insider, US News and World Report, Fast Company, Refinery29, and more, and received her coaching certification as, as one of only seven coaches in the world trained in the pivot method. If you're looking for someone who, believe in, who will believe in your potential career happiness as strongly as you do and help equip you with the ideas and resources to make it happen, you can learn more about Lisa's work at get, getcareerclarity.com and I'll drop that link in the uh, chat as well and turn things over to Lisa. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. Well, Christine and Ada, thank you for having me and thank you to all of you who are here with us live and thank you to everybody who's gonna be watching the recording of this afterwards. It is lovely to be with you. And I've got lots of content that I want to share because this question of finding the ideal career for you is one that feels so simple on its surface and yet feels darn near impossible to parse apart on our own in the live reality of our lives. So let me go ahead and jump into screen share mode here. And right actually before I do that, a couple of Zoom etiquette things for our presentation today. Uh, for our session, I'd love to have some interactivity. So please feel free to have the chat open as we are going through our conversation today. There will be a breakout at one point where we'll have you split into different rooms to get to know one another. So please feel free to turn on your video and take yourself off of mute for that. Those are not recorded. Uh, otherwise, please feel free to have yourself on mute and have your video off if you'd like to until we get to that point. And feel free to take any notes that you have. We should have some time at the end of the conversation today for questions, but if you've got some along the way that feel relevant to what we're talking about, please feel free to put those into the chat box as well. So with that said, first test to see if the chat is working is, can somebody let me know in the chat if you are successfully able to see uh, the the teal, the cerulean slides on my screen. Seeing a couple of thumbs up and make sure that I've got the chat box open. Fabulous. All right, perfect. Thank you all. So let me dive on in to say hello. Uh, thank you so much, Christine, for the introduction. I'm Lisa Miller, but if you knew me in my time at Barnard, I would have been Lisa Lewis, class of 2010 
a recovering perfectionist, obsessive learner, and a fellow overachiever to those of you who are taking an hour out of your day to learn more about finding the ideal career for you. And uh, I love that we've got such a wonderful group here today. And I would love to, in the chat, have everybody introduce themselves and let us know uh, your class year and where you're joining from to see how far afield from Manhattan the alumni network has spread here. And potentially so that we can start making some connections because one of the beautiful things about this alumni network is that people are so generous with their time, with their relationships. So knowing other people who might be in your area to connect with is always a wonderful thing. So got a lot of East Coasters already chiming in in the chat here. Love it. Oh, we've had a little bit of a Western uh, spread here as well. I am based right outside of Denver in Colorado. So I am in the mountain time zone for today. Oh, lovely. We've got a Brit joining us. Awesome. So as you're introducing yourself in the chat, I'll give you a little more information about me. Back in my time at Barnard, I was an economics major. And as our time in undergrad is such a formative time for thinking about what might be next in our careers, when you're an econ major, you look at a lot of your peers in the program and look at where they are going, what they're doing to create some certain expectations about where you might go and what you might do and what your path might look like. And so as an economics major who sought it out because I thought that the, the math was interesting and curious and the idea of incentives and people's behavior was really fascinating. When I look at the pathways that people who are economics majors were going into, I really saw investment banking and consulting as the two paths forward. And I am certain that those paths are wonderful fits for certain types of people with certain values and certain needs in their careers. But I knew that based on what I was needing and what I valued, those didn't quite feel like the right fit for me. And I had this existential crisis, even upon graduation of, have I messed everything up already? Have I committed myself to a major and a pathway that is incompatible with the kind of career and life that I want to be creating? And I have set myself up on a, a crash course, a collision course throughout the course of my career. Now, for any of you who have uh, graduated, you know that that is typically not usually the case, but Sometimes it is really difficult when you are in the moment of your undergrad experience to be able to see the forest for the trees and see how long and varied and adaptive a career path can be. And so I like to think that my interest in career development and progression started even back at this age and in this day of trying to figure out how do I take what I know about what I like and who I am and what I value and find the ways that that can manifest itself in a career path that feels good for me. Looking in at the chat, I'm seeing another economics major who did not want to take the banking path. I appreciate that. Aloha from Maui to Anne-Marie, how wonderful. And what that experience and then the course of my career so far has really taught me is that if our careers can span for 40 or more years, and occupy more waking hours than anything else during that era of your life, you deserve to enjoy what you're doing. You might not enjoy every single minute of every single day. It might not be as if you are having puppy dogs and glitter bursting forth from your computer, but you deserve to feel good in the work. Now, if you are here at this Finding the Ideal Career for You session because you feel like you don't feel good in your work or you don't feel like it fits. When I think about how to realign yourself with a career that feels good and that fits you, there are three main steps to that process. There's number one, coming up with strong fit ideas for you. So for example, in my time when I was an economics major, I knew that investment banking didn't feel like the right fit idea, but that question of if not this, then what? was looming and overwhelming. The next step to moving into the ideal career is validating that the idea you come up with aligns with your values and your needs in your life. Because as we all know, there's a big difference between an idea in its hypothetical theoretical form and how that manifests in day-to-day -day lived reality. And if we fall in love with the dream of an idea, 
and then we step into the reality and it doesn't quite match with our expectations, that sense of career misalignment or career distress can manifest quite easily and quickly. So the validation and the vetting and the risk management process is a big piece of moving towards the ideal career for you. And the third piece of finding the ideal career for you is making that career transition move happen. That if you are besotted with the idea of becoming a social worker and you've shadowed social workers and you've had a fabulous time, but then you don't take the next steps to actually make that pivot and that transition happen, it feels like it's all for naught. So in our session today, we're gonna to talk about each of these three things. And we're actually gonna talk about not just the mental model to strategically think about these things, but we're gonna talk about the biggest roadblocks that might pop up along the way that correspond with each of these three steps that can make them challenging. Vicki, I'm seeing your note in the chat. Love that you are a social worker now. I speak with lots of people who want to move into social work and I speak with a lot of people who want to move out of social work. And one of the biggest things that tends to happen when we think about career pathing is that we often will find ourselves anchored to a mental model that is either too broad and too general, or we find ourselves anchored to something that is so granular and specific, it really sucks all of the creativity and the possibility out of our directions. So I'll give you two examples. The general broad version is when you recognize that you are unhappy in what you are doing, and when you think about what you'd like to do, you come up with things like, I want to help people. I want to solve problems. I want the work to be meaningful. All of those things are wonderful. And I'm certain that all of those things are true, but those qualities are so broad and so far reaching that they can be really difficult to use as criteria to narrow down. Almost every single job that exists in the world is considered to be helpful, right? They wouldn't compensate you to do the work if that wasn't the case. So coming up with something that's a little bit more strategic, a little bit more narrow and focused can help you to figure out what some potential pivots could be. And the other challenge is when you are so narrowly focused that it doesn't actually feel like you have options. So this might be the person who, let's say we'll use social workers for an example here, who got your MSW, you've gotten your clinical licensure in your respective state. And when you think about what's possible for you for growth paths or what's possible for you to move into next, the only thing you really see is staying in your same specialization, working with your same population and just moving up the ladder in your same organization. While that absolutely is a path for growth, it may not necessarily scratch an itch for wider development and learning that might also be a big part of what you value in your career and in your life. So with that, let's talk about possible roadblock number one towards finding your way to an ideal fit career. It's hard to feel clear on an ideal career path when we're not 100% sure exactly what we want. So let me ask you in the chat, uh, how many of those of you who are with us today feel like you know what you don't want? You feel pretty clear on what you would like to leave behind in your last position or with your last employer in your last role. You feel really good about the things that you have almost a physical visceral reaction to of, I don't want to have coworkers like that or deal with problems like that or be treated like that. Let me check in on the chat, <laughs> so seeing some exclamation points. I absolutely know, very clear on what I don't want. Three uh, thumbs up emojis. Yeah, it took me a little while, but I feel like I know now. I want to leave behind burnout. Yeah, the things that we desire to leave behind, that we would prefer not to have in our lives, tend to make themselves really clear to us because of the somatic, physiological feedback that we get. You might know what you don't want because you feel the way that your shoulders start to approach your ears full of stress and distress and anxiety when you walk into your supervisor's office. You might know what you don't want because you're having a hard time getting out of bed and you feel so unenthused. We get a lot of really clear feedback. Now, it's a little trickier to know what we do want 
And I have a hypothesis that I'd like to posit as to why that is. So again, let me know in the chat if any of these things apply to you. Obviously, we know if you are here right now, you are a Barnard alum, which means that you probably got pretty darn good grades in grade school, or you took AB, IP, AP, IB, or honors courses. Uh, if you got a fairly impressive looking job after graduating or work for a well-known company, or feel like you followed the rules that you were taught at an early age about achieving career and academic success. These might be family rules, they might be cultural rules, they might be rules that you absorbed from your academic setting. If any of these apply to you, just let me know in the chat to make sure that I'm my hypothesis at least is speaking to the right audience of folks. Allison saying three out of four. Yep. I imagine for some of you, multiple of these bullets will apply. Elizabeth saying three out of four as well. Yeah. If any of these feel like they could describe you, Anne Marie saying three out of four as well, then here's the hypothesis. You learned how to win the academic achievement game. And that in and of itself was incredibly adaptive and helpful in a certain era of life because you were taught to learn, master, and excel at everything put in front of you. But you were never taught in school how to craft a soulful, fulfilling career and life. And in fact, some of the incentives that we faced throughout our academic careers kind of made it tricky to understand the pathway towards a soulful, fulfilling sense of our work. Because the focus was on running the academic race. It was on how do you write the best paper? How do you ace your chemistry exam? How do you make sure that you get 100% on your math test? And the focus is so often on how do I cultivate high performance in every single aspect of my life or of my academic life without having the discernment layer on there about do I actually want this? Do I like chemistry? Do I like writing papers? Or do I just need to do this to get into a good school and go to a, a great company to build a great career? And when we end up being really good at running the academic race and performing without necessarily having that level of discernment or that level of ability to act on the discernment about do I like this? Do I want this? Do I care about getting a good grade in this class? It leaves us in a situation where other people often will end up defining our success. We'll put success in air quotes, which can leave us feeling confused and swirling about what we want. And we get to be so good at learning how to do anything and performing and getting the right grades getting into the right clubs, maybe becoming president of the club, that we don't often stop to ask ourselves, do I want to do this? Do I enjoy doing this? Do I feel like the desire to do this is coming innately from me? Or is this coming from messages that I've absorbed, expectations from my family or from my cultural context? Now, here is the story of someone that I've worked with in the past named Olivia. Uh, she went to American University. She was a Division I soccer player. And when we met, she had just left the most successful role she'd ever had, closing million-dollar sales deals for a social media company that I'm sure almost all of you, if not all of you, use because she was completely burned out. And here's what she said that I thought was really telling. She said, success got to my head and it almost became my identity. It consumed me. I focused on the wrong things and I thought if this is all there is, there's something missing. I should be feeling joyous and happy with my achievements and that's not the case. And if any of, of, of Olivia's quote here resonates with you, let me know in the chat because this idea of if this is all there is can almost become this haunting refrain in our careers. Like, is this as good as it gets? Am I selfish for wanting something else? Am I being unreasonable? Am I acting entitled? Do I just need to suck it up and deal? So many of these thoughts and worries and questions come up as we're trying to navigate the complicated terrain of how do I find work that feels like it fits and work that feels like it could be sustainable over the decades of my career. 
And what we discovered from our work together was that she had had a lot of cultural messages to look for work that looked very impressive on the outside and ignore how it felt on the inside. Suck it up, just push through. They call it work and not play for a reason. So let me know in the chat if any of those kinds of cultural or social messages were things that you heard, whether or not you absorbed them, but were in your ecosystem throughout your youth or your adolescence. Because ignoring how it felt on the inside, I think is a pretty common trope. And it can also be really devastating when we are trying to understand what we want, as opposed to what we believe the world wants from us. And regardless of how you feel about Tony Robbins, I feel like this quote really hits home that, that tension, that dichotomy of success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. You know, if you end up in something that looks so shiny and so impressive externally, but doesn't feel the way you want it to feel on the inside, it brings up some really important and really difficult questions about what did I do this for? What was this worth? And how do I get things back into alignment? So that brings us to the question of how do we find a pathway to fulfillment in our success? If we are so clear on what we know we don't want, how do we find the things that we do want? And I went down the research rabbit hole in trying to understand that question. In the beginning of my career, I bounced around from job to job, trying to find the job that would, that would fix things, that would fulfill me, that was the one true perfect, like Goldilocks perfect bowl of porridge kind of a, a role. And I couldn't find it. I went from working at a nonprofit where I thought things would be so soulful and aligned with passion to working in uh, corporate communications consulting where I got tons of opportunities to learn and grow and money and opportunities to travel. But that didn't feel quite right either. So then I went in-house with a startup doing education work and that still wasn't it. So I took all of the books that I had been reading on personal development, professional development, career pathing, and started to realize that a bunch of different resources out there give you slivers of the equation. They give you pieces, they give you nuggets of wisdom, but they don't necessarily give you the big picture. And so I took what I was learning from these different luminaries and synthesized it into a more comprehensive philosophy called the four pillars of career fulfillment. And what I've seen through my work research-wise, you know, doing one-on-one -on -one career coaching and supporting individuals, and then anecdotally from other people's career transitions, pivots, and their outcomes, is that there are four core drivers of fulfillment and satisfaction in your work. And that in order to find an ideal fit career path for you, what you need is a role that gets you to a satisfied level across these four dimensions. The goal is not to be at 10 out of 10, completely perfect, you know, sunny blue skies, never a cloud in the sky feelings, but it's to be satisfied that your deepest core needs and priorities among these four dimensions are fulfilled. And that's when something becomes sustainable and feels like a good fit. So I'll show us the, the four pillars of career fulfillment methodology here in a moment. But what I'll say is that if any of you are in managerial or supervisory roles, that as you're thinking about this and learning about this model, don't just think about this for yourself and for your own career path and your own career discernment journey, but you can use this same model to help support and guide any direct reports that you have who are feeling out of alignment, out of whack in their work to try to find that pathway forward as well. So here are the four pillars of career fulfillment in a PowerPoint smart art presentation. They are strengths, personality, interests, and lifestyle. And I'll go through each of these one by one and give you a, a guiding question to help you understand how to analyze this in your own life so that you could almost create a rubric to say, okay, here's what I need in my strengths. Here's what I need in my personality driver. So we'll start with strengths. So the story of Olivia that we just talked about is a great one to illustrate your strengths. Now, when we talk about having alignment in your strengths as being important to your sense of fulfillment in your work, often when we talk about the idea of strengths, the, the typical parlance or the typical definition of strengths would be 
uh, the things that you're good at, your capabilities. And I would like to offer up an alternate way to think about strengths, which isn't necessarily as tied to your area of ability or capability or competence, but that's more tied to your energy. Does this work give you energy? Does solving this type of challenge or problem feel energizing? Do you get lost in flow and lose track of time? Do you find yourself naturally being pulled towards doing this kind of a, a function in your work or even in extracurriculars if you are doing volunteer work or you have a leadership role? So the question to ask yourself to identify what your strengths are is the question of out of everything that I can do, out of the wide breadth of capabilities and abilities that I have, what is the subsection that feels naturally intrinsically motivating? Where do I find myself getting the most fired up? What are the types of things that I am doing? And that short list is the list of your strengths. Now for Olivia, Olivia had capabilities at closing multi-million sales, multi-million dollar sales deals. She was very persuasive. She was able to create a lot of trust. But when we dug into what actually energized her, what we realized was that she loved building deep, intimate one-on-one -on -one relationships with individuals and getting to know them on a deeply personal level. And that had kind of been the foundation of how she'd been able to be successful in her sales role, but she didn't want to be using that to close deals in the same way anymore. So for Olivia, the ideal career pivot that she navigated and stepped into was moving into a role doing executive headhunting and recruiting so that she could be building these deep, intimate one-on-one -on -one relationships with individuals and helping them think through their own personal and professional development to see if they could find a mutual excellent fit at the organization that she was placing individuals for. So by narrowing down from everything she could do to the subsection of what energized her and lit her on fire, she was able to make a beautiful transition happen. So that's pillar number one, strengths. Now notice that when you look at the, the four circle diagram, or I suppose the five circle diagram, that strengths are important, but they're really only a quarter of the total career fulfillment equation. When you think about a lot of the traditional ways that we have been taught to job search in this modern era, of you go and you get on LinkedIn or you go and you get on Indeed and you scroll through job postings for five hours until you feel like your brain is starting to drip out of your ear. What you're looking at on those job postings, it's almost 100% tied to strengths and probably more in the capabilities era, not necessarily in the energizing arena. And when we are trying to evaluate potential future role fit, only looking at it through the strengths lens, as opposed to a more holistic lens that takes all four parts of the four pillars into account, you can see why it can be really easy to make decisions that don't ultimately pan out to be as fruitful or as fulfilling as they could be when we're going on limited information that's only one of these four dimensions. Now, what I'll also say is that there is a prioritization process that happens within each of the four pillars and across the four pillars. So for some of you who are here, the strengths pillar and doing work that feels energizing and aligned with your natural gifting might be the very most important thing to you to feel satisfied in your work. But as we walk through the other pillars, notice for yourself what your own personal prioritization might be. Maybe you're okay with doing work that doesn't feel quite as energizing or as life-giving if one of your other pillars is absolutely in alignment and feeling amazing. Only you are gonna know what that prioritization looks like for you. And identifying that prioritization then makes the search for a possible ideal fit career and the generation of ideas for that career so much easier. So let's talk about pillar number two, the personality pillar. Now, when I talk about personality, I really think about this as a catch all for values and natural wiring alignment. So when we talk about personality as a driver for career fulfillment, what that means is, the, the corresponding question is, do I feel like I can bring more of my full self to work? And that's 
a very complicated question to peel apart because there's so many factors that go into it. The personality fit could include geography of your physical work location. Do you love working in a, a bullpen kind of environment where you have lots of collaboration, lots of conversation with your colleagues? Or do you prefer being in a quieter space, like an office with a door or a cubicle with high walls? You know, has the pandemic and getting to work from home for those of you who are able been a huge godsend for you because it's allowed you to feel like you are working and producing at more of your full capability because the environment is in line with your personality needs. This personality question also extends to the values that an organization holds and how those manifest in the culture that's created within your department and within your team. Do you feel like your values are in alignment with the organization's values enough? There may not be perfect alignment, right? And that's where this prioritization and trade-offs piece comes in. But do you feel like on the big things that there's, there's a match and there's a fit? The personality piece also extends to your dynamic with your supervisor, your peers, and any of your direct reports. Do you feel like the way that you've created relationship with your supervisor enables you to have psychological safety, to be honest, to be able to contribute at your fullest capacity? And then of course, there is a social justice and a cultural piece to this too. Do you feel like people like you are respected? are getting opportunities to move into leadership, are able to contribute safely within the organization. And perhaps broader than that, do you feel like other types of people are also being empowered and enabled to feel included, to feel a sense of belonging, to feel like their voices matter, to feel like the organization's cultural ethos has space for everybody to have a seat at the table? So ask yourself that question on personality. Uh, do I feel like I can bring more of my full self to work? And if the answer is no, asking yourself what would it take can be very illuminating to figure out where to go next. So for this, I'll give you the example of Jason. Jason in Ohio majored in engineering, but became a teacher because he wanted to work with people. But when he started doing teaching, it felt too extroverted to be in alignment with his natural energy and his personality. So he went back into engineering management and development full time. But that wasn't the fit for him either. He felt like he was working in his strengths, but he didn't feel the kind of energy and alignment that he was looking for. And so we worked together to try to figure out why that was. And so after diving into that together, Jason figured out that the path to more career fulfillment and balancing his personality needs would be fulfilled by becoming an intrapreneur and making a transition from one role into another without needing to leave his company. He went from doing the engineering management work to running the new business development work for the company. So he had this really nice sweet spot of getting to have his extroverting needs scratched through his collaboration with different departments and colleagues, with being able to do presentations to potential future clients and with the, the process of putting everything together for a big pitch. But he also got to be working in a function that allowed for his introverted side as an ambivert to also get some energy and get some recharging because he would go and have some dedicated hours of work time to just put together the proposal, to respond to the RFP, to put together the pitch deck, to do the communications pieces. So one of the things about ideal careers that I think is really important is that sometimes you can pivot into something that is a much more ideal fit within your larger context once you know what's out of whack for you. When we looked at Jason's four pillars, what he noticed was that for the lifestyle pillar, the magnetic interest pillar, and then the strengths pillar, he was pretty well in alignment, but it was the personality one being so off that was causing him to think about leaving. So figuring out what was off and then figuring out a pathway towards more alignment there allowed him to extend his career with this organization even further in a way that felt good for them and that felt good for him. Now let's talk about the interest, magnetic interest pillar. So on the interest pillar, the question is, am I solving problems that are meaningful to me? And I really stay away from the word 
passions here because I think passions can come with a lot of pressure and a lot of expectation. Like you had to wake up in the morning and feel a certain way about your work and about your life. And I think that everybody can say that they have interests, even if not everybody can say they put their finger on one true perfect passion. So the question to ask yourself around magnetic interests is, am I interested in and do I care about the problems that I'm helping to solve day to day? And I'll tell you the story of Rachel to talk about that one. Rachel in Chicago went from bouncing between a handful of jobs that felt like they didn't fit to negotiating a full-time offer doing marketing project management where she could nurture her interest in outdoor recreation through her work. She had been doing a lot of work that was in alignment with her strengths. She was finding places that had a, a fairly decent personality fit, but it just hadn't felt right because she had this deep interest in outdoor recreation that wasn't really being expressed or manifested in any areas of her life. So when we found the opportunity to have her work for an outdoor uh, trade association, it enabled her to both get into alignment on her magnetic interests and to facilitate moving into a lifestyle that was a better fit for her as well. So now we'll talk about the last of the four pillars, which is the lifestyle pillar. And this one is one of my favorite ones to talk about because it's, there's so much possibility here, especially given what has happened over the last 18 months, right? Organizations who said, you know, our culture is too precious to us, we just won't do remote work, are now saying actually remote work might be the future and we want everybody to be working from home at least a couple days a week. So the lifestyle pillar is about how you want work to fit into your life. How much of the air in the room do you want work to take up? And this is a question of compensation. It's a question of benefits. And it's a question of balance and lifestyle flexibility. So the question to ask yourself around the lifestyle pillar is, is work fitting into my life the way that I want it to? And is it enabling me to have the kind of rich whole life that I want? And if not, again, what would it take to get into that space? Now I'll tell you the story of Tanya for this one because I love this story and I love that it is a true story. <laughs> so Tanya is an American expat in London, like one of our folks in the chat today and had a successful career working in entertainment, working for entertainment brands in the state, but found herself wanting more soulful work. And I remember that she almost like confessed in one of our conversations that she wanted a job where she'd have the autonomy and flexibility to go to a yoga class at 10 a.m that she was very invested in her physical and mental health and wanted to be enabled to take care of that in a way that was in alignment with her needs and her body while still being enabled to do the work that felt good uh, and be trusted to do it when it needed to happen. So after we talked about it and we said, Tanya, this is actually possible. This could be real for you. Let's see what's out there. And she was 100% believing that it was possible, she landed a role running European events for Wanderlust, where not only could she go to yoga classes during the day, but that they would be paid for and considered to be market research and partnership development. So, so much is possible across the lifestyle pillar. Now, there are a lot of things that you can do, especially with your Barnard degree, and you deserve to know which of them you actually want. So the four pillars methodology is that mental model to help you parse through to figure out what matters most to you. And I could say a lot, a lot more about this. I actually wrote a book on the four pillars framework. So if this is really interesting to you and you want to dive deeper into it and you are a bookworm like I am, uh, you can grab a copy of the first couple of chapters of my book for free at getcareerclarity.com slash roadmap. So if that's interesting, please feel free to go and check that out. Uh, but I want to give us a moment to have a conversation about the four pillars because the alumni community is so fabulous. I want us to go ahead and do a breakout that will make about, let's say, seven minutes. So Julia, if you're paying attention over there, let's do a seven minute breakout. So you'll have about six minutes of breakout time and then you'll get a 60 second warning that the breakout rooms are about to close. You can just let that expire. It'll pop you back into this main Zoom room here together. Uh, and we'll do groups of, let's say, five folks, if that works, Julia, Julia and Christine, um, because I want you to have a moment to process and talk about 
in this era of your life, which of the four pillars is the highest priority for you? And I say era of your life because it's going to evolve and change over time. There might be an era of your life where strengths are the most important. There might be an era of your life where lifestyle is the most important. So, and thank you to whoever's dog is, is chiming in in the background with the celebrity cameo here. So Julia, if you can uh, have everybody into breakout rooms here, you're about to get an invitation that says, you know, you're invited to join breakout room, go ahead and click okay or yes to join the room. And then feel free to introduce yourselves to one another to talk about the four pillars. And you won't be able to see the slides when you're in the room, but I'll go ahead and send you a chat with the four pillars, which are strengths, magnetic interests, personality, and lifestyle. So if you have had your video turned off here, as we invite you into the breakout rooms, please feel free to turn your video back on and to unmute yourselves so that you can meet each other and just have a quick conversation about the four pillars. So if we're gonna do a seven minute breakout that'll have us coming back into the room together about uh, five till, six or five till. So Julia and team, are we ready to send folks into breakout rooms? Do some private chat strings to connect or send LinkedIn messages or get phone numbers for future conversations. I love, I was in breakout room number five. It was great. A group of people with some interesting backgrounds and really we're definitely all agree we're going to download the free copy. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad to hear that. But before I jump back into uh, screen share mode here, I'm curious for folks to share in the chat about what the highest priority pillar is for you to see if there is a lot of agreement, see if we've got a lot of distribution pretty evenly across the pillars. Uh, so, and if you came out of your breakout room and you wish you'd had 30 more minutes, please feel free to use the chat function on Zoom and the private chat to connect with the people who are in your room and exchange contact information, connect on LinkedIn, whatever you need to do. But let me go ahead and peek over at the chat box here. Um, for you, what was the highest priority pillar in this era of life right now? Uh, and I'll tell you, I did this same exercise a couple weeks ago with a group of about 15 uh, professionals who all worked in a pretty similar capacity and they all had the exact same answer. So there was a lot of consensus on what the highest priority pillar was. And I'm curious to see if that is true of our Barnard Bears as well. And if any of you are looking in the chat box right now, uh, you can see that, that that does seem to be the case. Lifestyle is popping up uh, in abundance. So Anne, thank you for saying interest to add in a little uh, diversity of opinion and some variety here. Yeah, I think that this era of life and era of careers in particular, given what we have all just been through in the last year and a half, has really emphasized that there's so much more that's available lifestyle-wise to us than seemed evident even a year and a half or two years ago. But now it's really difficult to just go back to the same old. Like once your eyes have been open, you know, once a bell has been rung, it can't be unrung. So. It's really interesting to see everybody, almost everybody saying lifestyle. Rena, I see you too with interest in there as well. Nicole posed a really interesting question in the chat as well of being curious about if they're the only one who never wants to go back to the office full time. So chime in in the chat box if that is you too. And I will pop back into screen share mode. I know that we are scheduled to go until 15 past and I've got a bit more information I wanna make sure to cover with you all before I let you go or open things up for questions. Let me pop into screen share mode. And again, just let me know in the chat box quickly if you can see this. And yes. it'd be perfect. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then if we need to restart the recording, please go ahead and do that too. So let's talk about the other two possible roadblocks along your way to stepping into the ideal career for you. Because once you have learned the four pillars of career clarity methodology, once you have established what the highest priority is for you and you use that to lead your brainstorming and exploration process about what's out there and what's available and what might be in alignment, the next hiccup that we run into is this question of 
big, bold career, career changes can feel incredibly risky because nobody wants to leap and have to start over from scratch. If you have had 10, 20, 30 years established in one particular path and it is not feeling joyful or life-giving for you any longer, the idea of making a move into something new and then having to start over at the bottom of the corporate ladder, start over making you know, whatever you were making when you graduated, right? 20,000 a year, 30,000 a year, something like that can feel awful. And this fear and this question of risk makes sense because there's a possibility that you might end up worse off than ever before, right? You've probably seen someone who made a career move where it didn't work out, they didn't feel the way they wanted to feel, and they had given up a lot of things that were really precious to them. And this can be especially the case if you are making good money or have an impressive job. Uh, the golden handcuffs phenomenon is absolutely real. <laughs> Most of you, I'm sure, do not need me to tell you that. For those of you who are recent grads, this might not feel as true, but for those of you who have been in the, the working world for more than about five or six years, you know that you can end up on a path where you get so much time off or you make so much money or your bonus is so great or you have to stay until a certain time for things to vest that you feel stuck and that the risk of leaving feels too big. But here's what I would like to suggest, that we have to redefine risk. Because instead of thinking solely about the risk of leaving, it's important to ask yourself, what's the risk of staying? What are the risks of being in the same path for the next 10, 20 years? Maybe I've gotten a promotion, maybe I've gotten a newer, shinier laptop, but I am generally doing the same kind of work or the same kind of team in the same kind of industry and same kind of company. How does that feel? And when you ask yourself that question, all of a sudden, the risks on both sides of the equation become a little bit more explicitly illustrated. And as for the risk in leaving, you can absolutely make a shift and manage transition risks at the same time. And in fact, that's what most top performers do on a regular basis. There was an article in Fast Company where the former head of talent at Netflix said, put this on the record, that the expectation was that top talent was expected to switch jobs or companies every three years. Right? You're not a job hopper anymore, that this is actually the expectation of the high performers, the high potentials, you know, the, the top talent within a company. And people like those of us who are coming to a, a session on career development, people who are motivated by learning will often outgrow our current roles and responsibilities faster than other people. So looking at your four pillars and trying to figure out what's next and where you want to go from here might happen more often for you than it happens for some of your peers, either your friend group, your peers within the organization that you're currently working at. And that's okay. You know, the one right job model where you go to school and then you do the same work for 40 years, and then you retire with a sheet cake and a retirement party and a pension, that model has never really worked for people who love to grow and advance in their careers anyways. I love these three examples. Julia Child worked in advertising, media, and secret intelligence before writing her first cookbook when she was 50, launching a new career as a celebrity chef. Jonah Peretti was teaching middle schoolers how to use Microsoft Office before launching BuzzFeed and the Huffington Post in his 30s. And even Pope Francis had an unlikely beginning. If you watch the, uh, the movie on Netflix, The Two Popes, you've heard pieces of this, but before Pope Francis was ordained, he was a lab tech. That's the part that they cover in the movie. And he was also a bouncer at a bar at home in Argentina. So hunger to learn, flex and evolve in your career has become an asset and it is not a liability anymore not a social reputational liability, not a professional liability. Now let's talk about the last possible roadblock to moving into that ideal career, which is if you have gone through that first process of discernment with your four pillars, you've come up with some ideas, you've vetted them, you've tested them, you've gotten excited about them, you've managed the risk and you're ready to make your transition. Completely rebranding and rebuilding your network in order to make a change is challenging. 
and I am an introvert. For those of you who are Myers-Briggs nerds like myself, I'm an INTJ. And so especially if you identify as an introvert, it can feel really uncomfortable and stressful to think about making a career pivot and the extroverting work that goes into that. But I want to tell you that the Bureau of Labor Statistics every single year does a study on how people acquire and land jobs. And every single year, the data is wildly consistent and says that 70% or more of jobs that are secured come from relationships, not from the hours you are looking at jobs on the internet. So when it comes to actually executing the transition to step into that ideal career for you, effective job searching is really about changing your professional brand into compelling persuasive storytelling, something that feels human, that feels authentic, that feels relatable, so that you become something different from a two-dimensional piece of paper like your resume is. And it's also about approaching networking as strategic relationship building, or what I sometimes refer to as uh, developing professional friends. Because the more that people know you and like you, the more they're likely to stick out their necks for you, open doors for you, walk your resume into the hiring manager, make an introduction for you, or all the things that tend to give you access to jobs besides just through online job boards and the applicant tracking system portals of Doom. So in our time together today, we've talked about the three steps to finding and securing an ideal career and the three roadblocks that everyone can come across in navigating a career change or career clarity journey. And that there's a framework through the four pillars to help you figure out what you want, manage the risk and go get it. However, to bring us in for a close before we get to time for questions, information by itself isn't enough. I really appreciate this cheeky quote from internet entrepreneur, Derek Sivers, who says that if more information was the answer, then we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. So I want for you to be able to consume all the information that we've gone over in today's session and find a way to operationalize it and turn it into action in your life. And I'll say getting help isn't a sign of weakness, it is a sign of strength. So as we come to a close for today, don't let this information die on the vine. Make an action plan for yourself for whatever you need to be moving towards that ideal next step in your career whether that's mapping out your own four pillars, whether it is taking some time for self-discernment or self-awareness around how well is my current situation meeting my four pillars. Maybe it's creating some time to talk with people who are doing roles that you've been curious about but haven't yet had the momentum to take action on. Uh, and you can create your own rubric using the four pillars to evaluate potential opportunities. So with that, Thank you all for being here today, for listening to all of this great information on finding the ideal career for you. If you have more questions for me that you are not feeling comfortable asking in our live session today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can reach me directly at lisa at getcareerclarity.com or you can go check out the website at getcareerclarity.com or pick up a copy of the book, but I'm here for you. This is sticky, messy, complicated work and it's so satisfying gratifying, fulfilling, and worthy work to do to create a career path that feels like it fits. So with that, let me go ahead and I'll take myself off of screen share. And we have a couple minutes for questions and then I will turn it over to Ada for some closing remarks here as well. So if you want to go ahead and put questions into the chat box, please feel free. Or if you are feeling courageous and want to take yourself off mute to ask a question, by all means, please do that as well and check out all the fabulous links that Christine has been putting into the chat box and will be putting into the chat box for resources for you along your career discernment journey. Let me go ahead and check the chat box to see if anybody has submitted any questions there. And if not, and if you're feeling like you'd like to take yourself off of mute, please feel free to do that as well. Seeing any questions coming in in the chat box? Anybody have any last questions while we're still together? Uh, Lisa, yes. Sharon Meltzer here. Thank you very much. I think this is wonderful. And uh, practically, 
I'm thinking of it as a component of a course that I would like to create to become the interface between young people's futures in the world and academia. You know, uh, there's always been a big question about what is the role of an education? Should it be a career education or should it be this liberal artsy general opening of the mind? And I, I think that the way the curriculum is going these days, very much in the direction of STEM, <clears throat> and I would not like to see it go further in that direction, uh, we're missing out on the opportunity to figure out and teach how to monetize the disciplines. I would love to see a course don't tell them, don't ask me now how exactly I would create it, except that I would surely include your, your book, um, where all the value in the academic world, the accumulated wisdom of the world, um, which is divided into disciplines that have temperamental correlatives, um, could somehow be um, salvaged by finding strategies for internalizing them and then externalizing them, getting them out there in the world through you. I had a career like that. I was a perfect fit. Uh, I spent most of my years in a community college teaching position, but it was of disciplines I adored and that I discovered as I kept teaching. Mm. Um, you know, And I retired with a pension. Um, but I always adjusted my career ambitions to lifestyle because I had children early. Uh, so, you know, I'm a very lucky person. I've kind of had it all, but I think about it a lot for the young people that I see struggling with exactly what you're trying to help them with. And because I spent my life in academia and, and I believe in a lot of what it has to offer, I, I really love to find a way to salvage it for people, for the world, uh, and for our temperamental variations, which are in many ways expressed in the disciplines. Anyway, it's just a thought that I've been struggling with for a long time. And thank you for this wonderful piece, indispensable reading, I would say you would be. Well, thank you so much for that, Sharon. And you're bringing up, uh, a very important existential issue that I think all of academia is wrestling with right now, which is how do we both continue to honor the classical liberal arts education of teaching people how to think and giving context to solve messy, complicated problems with also how do we make sure that this is as relevant and applicable as it can be to solve the real world problems that we're facing today? Because there's this interesting tension of the economy is evolving faster than ever before. So if you were to double down on the technical side, it's going to be irrelevant in five years anyways. You know, when I was in uh, my undergrad, social media didn't really exist in the same way. Twitter and Instagram hadn't been born yet. TikTok certainly hadn't been born yet. And now those are multi-billion dollar industries that have tens of thousands of jobs. So Sharon, I think you're, you are identifying a really interesting and important crux of some questions that Barnard, among many other institutions, is probably wrestling with the right way to address right now. Yeah, well, I, I don't know a lot of detail about the new curriculum at Barnard, but I've got a granddaughter who's going to be starting in the class of uh, 25, and it gives me more incentive than ever to, to think about things like this. I think they have tried to adapt what they consider to be the basics of the areas in which you're going to have to learn in the future uh, into the curriculum so that people would be prepared to make these adaptive changes that you're talking about. Uh, and, and I'd like to know more about it because uh, on, on a very uh, excellent level, that, that is what curriculum should do. You're, you're learning how to learn, but in what ways do you have to learn? Or I'll jump in. I'll jump in here for just a sec to say that, uh, you know, this is a lot of what Beyond Barnard is about is a lot of, the, I, I talked a lot about sort of more the practical side of it and what we advise on, but what part of what we've been doing for the last three years is this rethink in terms of, uh, well, there's sort of two main tenets. One, speaking to what you're talking about, is that 
um, we see it as sort of a false dichotomy between what you're doing in the classroom and what you do at work. And so part of our mission is to work with students and alumni to translate that liberal arts uh, curriculum and their, you know, as, as well as, you know, the, their areas of specialization into workplace skills. Um, so it's some, definitely something we're thinking about working on. So definitely, and congratulations on your granddaughter, Sender, to be on Barnard uh, right away. Um, and then the <laughs> other, I, I started to type it into the chat and then stopped that Lisa mentioned her, um, um, you know, feeling as an economics major that it sort of pointed her in a particular direction that, that didn't necessarily feel right. And one of our other major tenets is that your major does not direct the entirety of your career, or in some cases not, you know, there's not an obvious match even from the beginning between your major per se and, and what you do. So, uh, so it's definitely Sharon, you know, really, really good points and something we're wrestling with and we, you know, love to continue the conversation. I'd love to talk to you more about this. I, I've had uh, fantasies of going and talking to President Bylock about this, this idea. Mm -hmm. You're, you're working on it on a, an abstract and, you know, at the same time, very practical right, level. Right. I was thinking of it because of the nature of my perhaps stultified um, career in academia. And I was in excellent institutions for a very substantial part of my life, but then in a pedagogical situation for another substantial part of it, more in terms of the value that is already inherent in our academic disciplines, uh, which is another angle. You know, I think what you're doing is far more basic and far more important, uh, obviously, for the students. But um, I just don't, I don't want to lose all the value that it's taken us thousands of years to accumulate. Absolutely. Well, I want to be mindful of and respectful of everyone's time. So I will pass the microphone back over to Ada to bring us to a close for today. I saw there were a couple questions that came through in the chat that we didn't have time for. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my personal email into the chat. So if you want to reach out to me directly with those questions, I am so happy to, to address them, but Ada, I'll let you take it away. I just wanna say thank you to you, to Christine, um, to everyone today for participating, sharing your insights and being with us today. Uh, again, to the, our guests, uh, Lisa, thank you for joining us, for reaching out to Barnard. Uh, we hope you all will join us and continue to join us for Reunion Reimagined. The Reunion Committee has worked really hard and we have some fun events. Uh, and please visit reunion.barnard.edu to learn more about the upcoming programs. And thank you to everyone who participated, went to the breakout rooms, and to Julia and to Anne. Thank you again to everybody and Brianna. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everybody. This is great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all.